The Word, Pierced, Striped, and Bruised An Obrey Project Presentation by Jonathan McTemus The following presentation was written for an audience who may have no concept of the distinction of Obrey from Hebrew. Those who are more familiar will find some of it repetitious, but repetition is one of the best tools of learning. This presentation at this point has gone through many drafts. The chief reason for this are the complexities of the situation and materials, and how to adequately relay the problem. This is especially compounded when one such as myself has come to understand the language called Hebrew in such a radically different way. Yahweh has become Yahweh. Yeshua Jesus has become Yusho. Elohim, Aliyim, and so forth. So please bear with me as I do my best to present an English audience concepts concerning Masoretic Hebrew from an Obery understanding, if that makes sense. If not, let me explain further. Obery is the title I've given to a language without all of the Jewish influence that Hebrew has. Obri is a word consisting of four successive glyphs combined, meaning of Ober, or in Masoretic, Eber, the father of Pileg and the patriarch, most likely at Babel in Genesis 11. They are, in fact, the very glyphs the old non-Israelite scribes and Masoretes used and distorted via their vowel points and altered script face to arrive at the word Hebrew. Many of the terms have been altered as well, so attempting to illustrate the problems with Masoretic Hebrew, or just Hebrew, which I've come to call Jewbrew, while using their terms on their playing field, is a bit moot. I will, however, do my best to illustrate some of the problems that I hope best illustrate the current state of the text without too many foreign terms to an English audience. I'll also not be spending any time on other texts, such as the Septuagint, Samaritan Pentateuch, or Vulgate, as these texts tend to agree with only some parts of the various Hebrew manuscripts and do not always agree with one another. My aim is to stay just within the so-called Hebrew text. Let it be known that I do not now or ever claim to be an expert in quotes, in linguistics or grammars. I do not claim to be an expert in anything. What I am is a German slash Celt with a rough past who has had grace given to me. This grace has caused me to treasure the scriptures above all manner of works possessed by a creature such as man. I'm enthralled by the scriptures, and because of this, I have a great desperation to know their author and exactly what he was communicating, that I may hope to walk with him as best as I'm able. It wasn't until this deep journey into the Word that I began realizing what and who I was, who we are, and what and who the Jew is today. At a point, one is forced to ask fundamental questions regarding the nature and identity of the Jew and the Western European in light of biblical truths and present realities. The details of some of these inquiries are difficult to determine, as our enemies have been controlling a great deal of information for quite a long time, but one fact that is not at all that difficult to arrive at is that the Jew is the enemy of all that is good, natural, godly, orderly, enlightening, and productive. Would anyone disagree? Moreover, the Jew bears no biblical prophetic marks that the house of Israel and the house of Judah would bear. Does anyone disagree? That being said, 
How many here trust what the Jews have to say about the Scriptures? How many hearing this would trust that any change a Jew would affect on the Scriptures would be a good change, a benevolent change, a trustworthy change? The reason for pointing these things out is because the Hebrew Scriptures as we know them are brought to us by Jews, and Hebrew as we know it is a linguistic expression built from countless Jewish devices. My task today is to relate to you the mechanisms and devices employed by the Jews to alter our understanding of the Scriptures. The Masoretic Hebrew, or Jewish Bible, is an organism held together by a great number of claims and techniques. Among these are the letter, the underlying assumptions, the vowel points, the scribal traditions, the orientation, the notes, the pericopes, the verses, the abbreviations, the recensions, the undocumented claims, the random anomalies, the fairy tales, and the lies. That doesn't cover it all, I'm afraid, and unfortunately time will not allow me to dive very deeply into these concepts that weave their way throughout Scripture driven by centuries of animosity. So I will instead talk about a few of them and hopefully dispel some of the nonsense we've all been made to accept, typically through our once trusted authorities. The Glyph Let's begin with the letter itself, or as I call it, and I believe more precisely, the glyph. Mar Ukba, a celebrated chief judge of the Jews in the 3rd century AD, said, quote, At first, the Torah was given to Israel in Hebrew characters and in the sacred language, but in the time of Ezra, they obtained it in the Assyrian square characters and in the Aramaic language. At last, the sages chose the Assyrian square characters and the sacred language for the Israelites and left the Hebrew characters and the Aramaic language for the idiots. Closed quote. Even though there is no proof whatsoever that Ezra had anything to do with changing the glyph itself, Ukba reveals a very important detail. The, quote, letters, as they call them, or the Hebrew character, as we know it today, is Ma'ashur, or Assyrian. Would this line up with any biblical information? It does. With 2 Kings 17, 24 through 33, from the KJV adjusted and expanded as needed. Quote, and the king of Asher, Assyria, brought men from Babel, Babylon, and from the area of Kut, and from Awa, and from Hamat, and from Saparoim, and placed them in the cities of Shimron, or Samaria, instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Shimron, and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there, that they feared not Yahweh. Therefore Yahweh sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Asher, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Shimron, know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the Aliyim God of the land. Then the king of Ashur commanded, saying, Carry there one of the priests whom ye brought from there, and let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then 
one of the priests whom they had carried away from Shimron came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear Yahweh. Howbeit, every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Shimronim, or Samaritans, had made. Every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt, and the men of Babel made Sekut Benut, or brothels, and the men of Kut made Neragal, pilgrimage, and the men of Hamat made Ashima, fiery cauldrons, and the Awim made Nibhaz, or vision quest, and Tartak, or mutilations, and the Separoim burnt their children in the fire to Adremelech, the king of procreation slash spring, and Anemelech, the king of humiliation, the gods of Separim. So they feared Yahweh and made unto themselves of the most undesirable priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared Yahweh and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. Closed quote. Unfortunately, there isn't time to unpack and expound upon all the obvious translator-generated confusion intentionally inserted into that passage. But relating to that quote from Ukba, there is an interesting aspect to the Jewish word Mazora or Mazarit, and that is their arbitrary alterations of the phonetics of the Sha, which is the 21st glyph in the Obri alphabet or glyph set, thus easily deriving Asura from Ashura, meaning Assyrian-like. Adding the prefixed M, making a concept an instance of a noun, we arrive at Ma'ashure, or Masura. Thus the title of the Masoretic text. Now, even though we have no scriptural evidence of Ezra or any Israelite altering the text in any way, we know these people brought from Assyria or Asherah before Ezra's time had mixed with and formed alliances with our ancient neighbor adversaries and had deluded themselves to the point of believing Yahweh was indeed their God. This from Ezra 4, 1 through 4. Quote, now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto Yahweh, God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon king of Asher, which brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief fathers of Israel said unto them, You have nothing to do with us to build a house to our God, but we ourselves together will build unto Yahweh God of Israel, as King Kurush or Cyrus, the king of Paris, Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah, and troubled them in building. Quote. In addition, there are the words of Asaph the seer and psalmist, who wrote in Psalm 83, 3 through 8, quote, They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. 
the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites, of Moab and the Hagarenes, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher also is joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Close quote. Concerning that last line, we know from Nehemiah that the people brought by Asher, Assyria, were allied with Ammon, the children of Lot. We also know from Scripture that no change in the form of the text, nor any of the 66,000 variations existing even in Yusho Jesus' day, as in both his time and that of the apostles, not one of them had to refer to which text they are citing, be it with a different character, a variation in form, or a different language. Even found in the documents called the writings of Flavius Josephus is the admittance that there was still a perfect text in existence in the house of Yahweh in the land of Judah in the first century A.D. The change of the meaningful glyph to the empty letter came after this time, and there still exists many older forms of the Obri glyph that the Jew must recognize and spin, of course, in their own publications, as far too many examples exist to be destroyed or controlled. The simple fact is, before our text was changed at some point, it bore far more of a resemblance to our Western European forms, and that's in letters or glyphs, words, and grammar. With the presence of these older examples of the glyph form, and no indication within all of Scripture of any sort of change, and with what I've just cited from within and without Scripture, if we accept this later Jewish form in the glyphs themselves, we do it purely on faith. That is, faith in the claims of the Jews. The Underlying Assumptions This is perhaps more a broad category than a single point, because these assumptions or claims work together and saturate everything we know about Hebrew so-called. This section and presentation will not begin to cover the far-reaching implications of these assumptions, but instead will attempt to illustrate the real problems within them. These are technically known as matres lectionis, or mother of language, and the concepts of plen versus defective spelling, and kir and kathib, which accompany the first concept. These are all ubiquitous devices within the text, so I will try to simply point out the problematic nature of them. Matris lectionis, or sometimes called mater lection, is the idea and baseless claim that Obri slash Hebrew has not, nor ever has had, any vowels. This claim is baseless because there is absolutely no proof of its veracity, and furthermore, there are clues that alert us to the same. The first large, glaring clue is just how remarkably similar to our Western alphabet, the Obri alphabet is, so the Hebrew alphabet before the Obri glyph was altered to the square Ma'ashere from Assyria, Masoretic, letter. We have around 20 to 28 characters in our Western European alphabet as compared to the 22 in Obri. However, some are diaphonic or redundant, such as C for K and S, or I for Y or E, and U for W. Some are latecomers, and some are obvious phonetic variations and insertions, such as J, F, and V. Even with these slight variations, we share 19 
15 direct phonetic matches, most in the same or approximately the same position in the alphabet with the Hebrew slash Obri. The next clue is the fact that what they call weak or quiescent consonants are the equivalent of our vowels, the so-called aleph, he, yad, ayin, and wa are simply a, e, i, o, u in obri. All of these Paleo-Hebrew obri glyphs even look like our modern Western characters. All of the names the Jews have applied to the obri glyph set are easily dropped for the Germanic way of pronouncing the alphabet. Therefore, Aleph is A, Bet is Be, Gimel is Ge, Dalit, De, and so forth. With this in mind, what the Jew does is claims none of the weak consonants or our vowels were even present in the earliest form of Hebrew. They claim vocalizations were mostly performed via tradition, and that various scribes added many of these letters into the text to, in their words, aid in pronunciation or distinguish between homonyms. Of course, as with all other Jewish claims on the text, there is no consistency in this assumed technique, nor, as I've demonstrated, biblical evidence of any such thing ever taking place. But if we believe them, that the obvious vowels are just weak consonants to aid pronunciation or to avoid homonym confusion, they now have a great deal of control over what the text may or may not say. They have applied terms to aid in their claims via Masoretic notes. Those terms, as stated, are plen versus defective spelling and kir and kathib readings. Christian D. Ginsburg, a converso Jew, published a very lengthy four-volume set called the Masora with two S's, in which these variations are documented. If a Masoret claimed a word was plen, meaning full, they were claiming it was penned with the matres lectionis, weak consonant, added. If they claimed it was defective, then the Jewish copyist penned it without the weak consonant, or, in reality, the vowel, and perhaps, according to the particular Masoret, should have added it. If they applied a mark and a cough, the Jewish Q, and kaf, the Jewish K, this would mean that though a word were written in a certain way, it should be pronounced as a different word, which they would often write in the margin. As I realize, I am now at the precipice of a great chasm of foreign terminology and confusion for my audience. I'll reel it back in and state this issue in the simplest of ways. This means that they can and have changed words, word meanings, and potentially the understanding of entire concepts with these devices. With the presence or absence of A or A, the Jewish Aleph, they could change Melech. M-L-K, being translated king or pagan god, to Malak, M-L-A-K, being translated messenger or laborer or angel, as we understand, and vice versa. They could change bar, B-A-R, being translated well, spring, pit, to bar, B-R being translated sun, air, pure, clean, field, grain, or potash, and vice versa. They could claim either of those were bara, B-R-A, to create, and so on. 
with a variation of E or E, that's the Jewish he, they could make something feminine, masculine, and vice versa. They could change the location of a thing from precise to general, and vice versa. And the Tiberian school were known to do just this rather routinely, in fact. They could change the aspect of a verb by adding or subtracting the Y or E, the Jewish Yad, and on and on and on it goes. And remember, the devil is in the details. So, could we just work the rest of our already troublesome lives at amassing as many Jewish texts as they've allowed to be published, along with as many Koine Greek, Latin, and otherwise we could get our hands on, compare all the instances of certain words and certain locations, and then refer again back to their sources for lexicography and come to some conclusions that way? We could. And we have, and unfortunately, we are not all that much further down the road than we once were centuries ago. Could we trust that our God divinely inspired a certain specific English manuscript, even in the face of massive textual and conceptual problems? We certainly could, and have. And that, too, has led to us chasing our own tales and forming all manner of sometimes benign and sometimes highly bizarre beliefs and practices. We could instead see this for what it is, confusion, and approach this in a very different way. By way of comparing words with high levels of common occurrences and therefore low chances of manipulation, we can observe the tone or effect a glyph has on a word. We may find that A, A, has an augmentative, primal, male effect. Thus, Y, ASEP, A, S, P, means gather or bind, where SEP, just S, P, simply means container. Where BO, B, O, is something full of, BA, B, a is to enter in. Tsu, tsa, yu is a command, but tsa, tsa, a is a going forth. We could further note that the e or e has a broadening, softening effect at the end of a word, has an enlarging and absolute effect at the beginning of a word, and a widening effect within a word. Therefore, why Yahweh changed Abram's name to Abraham, thus broadening his production with the E inserted within the Rem syllable, A-B-R-E-M. And he changed Shari or Sarai's name to Shere with the end E, becoming Sarah as we know it, thus softening the name of a woman hardened by her years of barrenness. We may see that the E, or Y, is a masculine force or will. It changes a thing to an action. Amor, A M R, word, is Iamor, he spake. It possesses, thus Obri, O-B-R-Y, is of Ober. Or it can vary in action from passive, like Mush, M-U-Sh, to be removed, to active, Mish, M-Y-Sh, departed. With Matris Lectionis, Plen versus Defective, and Kir versus Kathib, we again see interdependent and inconsistent Jewish concepts that rely on the belief of the hearer as to their veracity. We have to believe the Aliyim God who determined to have his mind in relationship to man, and our fathers in particular, allowed it all 
to be recorded in a language subject to whims, speculation, and opinion. Because if you believe the Jewish model, all you have is opinions and their hegemony over the text and how we understand it. These particular devices sow the seeds of endless confusion, and as far as the Jewish concerned, whether they ever really understand all these things or not may not really be the point, so much as whether we understand them or not. And even that alone, in my mind, is enough reason to reject these concepts. The vowel points. The vowel points accent marks, and additional textual signs, minus something called punctus extraordinaire, which is its own peculiar oddity, are entirely mounted on the shoulders of the Masoretes, and the Masoretes are phantoms. There's no solid proof these individuals did actually exist at the time and place it is claimed they existed, and among the most well-known of the Masoretes, of the Tiberian school, which was the emergent Masoretic text type, are characters such as Moses ben Nephtali and Aaron ben Asher, Moses and Aaron being the well-known Levite brothers, and Nephtali and Asher are both the names of the second sons of Rachel and Leah's handmaids, Bilhah and Zilpah, respectively. Out of these two assumed families, the emergent one was Ben Asher, both father and son, again Moses and Aaron, Ben Asher. The vowel points and accent marks do far more to the text than the Jewish claims of standardizing proper pronunciation or directing cantillation, being an intoned liturgical recitation, as opposed to cantellation, a geometric reduction, which may not be all that far off either. The vowel points direct the classification of words. This is why odor, H5737, may be categorized as lacked, or failed, or dig, or keep, while odor, H5739, is categorized as flock, or drove, or herds. Now, we can't blame all the English variants on the Masoretes, but we can blame the sharp separation of one word into multiple homonyms on them. We can blame all the word parsing on them. We can blame Hebrew grammar rules as we know them on them because of their word parsings, or deeming when a word is different in word type than its other occurrences, i.e. noun, verb, adjective, adverb, determiner, substantive, and so on. These things, the Masoretes, the phantom spooks of language, should bear. These occultists took the word which was, by all reason and internal evidence, a compilation of many inspired books, of many black-and-white concepts, and faded much of it into gray. Gray is the color the Jews work in. Gray is uncertainty, confusion, and controversy. As long as the Goyim know only gray and their adepts know the black-and-white, they have the power. But just in case anyone out there is not convinced of how mangled the text is due to the Masoretic vowel pointing, allow me to illustrate. The following are taken from the book Accidents of Hebrew Grammar by Henry Coffey. This title again is a farce as Accidents, A-C-C-I-D-E-N-C-E, -E, as any apt reader could readily admit, could or maybe should just as well be accidents, A-C-C-I-D-E-N-T-S. I assure the listener the grammatical rules and concepts to be found within this work are generally identical in any other work on the subject, but 
I certainly invite all to check. From the preface, quote, the chief difficulties that face one entering on the study of Hebrew arise from the number and instability of the Masoretic points and the changes incident to the weak, quiescent, and guttural letters. The aim to lessen these difficulties will explain most of the departures in the following pages from what might otherwise seem a more logical method of treatment. Closed quote. And again, quote, as long as Hebrew was a spoken language, there was no regular method of representing the vowels. The pronunciation of a given word had to be known from the context or from tradition. Thus, Debar, D-B-R, could stand for Debar, Dober, Dibber, etc. Closed quote. Those words at the end of that quote are all the same word, spelled the same, with not but a Masoret standing between us and understanding the true meaning of that one word via the parsed occurrence's similar characteristics. Rules of grammar are like any other rules. They are either consistent and make sense, or they are inconsistent and do not. Any former English student, or even a child, learning via rote and phonics, knows what a bastard language English is. We know this because the rules are not consistent. When we trace English back, we see that the English we know and use today was generated from about 30% German, with a whole lot of bits and pieces of other languages forced into it. This is a big reason why English grammar rules aren't consistent. Would one expect the language the Almighty chose to record his will and character, not to mention vital prophecy within, to be so inconsistent? All his natural rules are consistent. His creation follows consistent order. The sun, the moon, and the stars move in order consistently. The seasons, the hydraulic cycle, the tides follow an orderly consistency. He himself doesn't change. He is consistent. There's even consistency of his voice throughout his word, which is one way we know it's his word. Consistency of voice. Would he then, do you suppose, choose to hand down all his word to us that he saw fit for us to retain in a language form as radically inconsistent as Masoretic Hebrew? I cannot even begin to relay to you the sheer amount of incidents of rule-breaking, adjusting, ignoring, bending, and contriving one will find in just this little 132-page tome. But here are just a few examples within the first 10 pages. Page 4, concerning full or plen and defective writing. The consonant so remaining is said to quiesce in its cognate vowel. When a long vowel is thus indicated by a quiescent consonant and a vowel point, it is said to be written fully. When indicated by a point only, it is said to be written defectively. Page 5. Compound shua is made up of one of the short vowels and a simple shua. It is used mostly in connection with the gutturals. Page 6. Most words are accented on the last syllable. Some, like melic and certain parts of the verb, are accented on the penult. Page 7. An unaccented open syllable usually has a long vowel. Metheg, therefore, usually shows that the vowel is long and that the following shua is vocal. 
at times, the diacritical point of shin coincides with holum, because they're the same mark. Shin is osh, when the preceding letter has no other vowel. Sin is so, when it begins a syllable and has no other vowel. The sin shin is show, when it begins a syllable and has no other vowel. It is os, when it is in the middle of a word and is followed by a vowel. It is as, at the end of a word or syllable. Wa, with the holum, is wo, when a vowel proceeds. It is ow, when a vowel follows. Shurek, which is wa, with a dot at the middle left, with a vowel preceding and following, is wa, with dagesh forte, otherwise it is shurek. An accented syllable, whether open or closed, may have a long or short vowel. And on page 10, the construct infinitive is usually the base of the imperative and imperfect. How would you like the people making our laws to be that inconsistent? Oh wait, they are. Who do you suppose is making our laws? Again, I must stress that was in the first 10 pages where there are a lot of blank gaps therein and before things begin to get really complicated. Is this the language form you're ready to put your faith in? Because again, faith is what's required here and plenty of it. Blind faith, in fact. To further inform you on just how radically inconsistent Masoretic Hebrew and its rules are, I compiled a list of variant type words used in just the first 50 pages, consisting of in case, should be, loses, deprived, added, inserted, liable, some, sometimes, certain, often, ordinarily, irregular, change, replace, whenever, omission, transfer, dropped, so far as, instead, rearrangement, compensate, and many ifs and buts. This is the Masoretic style. These are the Masoretic rules. These are what we are basing much of our understanding of the Bible off of. Confusion, insecurity, debatability, abstractions, indeterminations, lack of qualification, and downright arbitrary classification. And if you're still unsure as to whether or not to trust Masoretic Hebrew as a viable grammatical foundation, have I mentioned the Masoretes? phantoms or not, and all the masses of commentaries and biblical literature surrounding, defending, and developing their system are indeed, and unmistakably, Jews. In summation, as you can see, just covering the broad stroke points of three out of the many issues with the Jewish textual tradition has taken up a good deal of time. Any one of the points I mentioned earlier could be expanded on into a presentation far longer than this. Therefore, I will unfortunately not be able to discuss the scribal traditions, the orientation, the notes, the pericopes, the verses, the abbreviations, the recensions, the undocumented claims, the random anomalies, the fairy tales, and the lies. But I would like to conclude this with my thoughts on Hebrew, Jewbrew, those who control and perpetuate it, and our responsibilities. There are a lot of different opinions on who exactly the Jews are. Some believe they are apostate Israelites who God has rejected. Others believe they were once 
Israelites slash Judahites who mixed ad nauseum with other races until they were unrecognizable to their long-lost distant kin, us. Still others believe them to be more direct descendants of Esau Edom, bearing the negative connotations and prophecies Esau's children bear from Scripture. I, however, don't entirely subscribe to any of these beliefs, though I do believe the blood of Esau flows in their veins. I believe the blood of Cain, Ham, Japheth, Canaan, Ishmael, Esau, Amalek, Moab, Ammon, along with Asher, Assyria, Elam, the Chaldeans, and other peoples who surrounded us and were ever at odds with us, and who knows who else and what else, flows in their veins. There is, for whatever reason, we shall one day fully understand a murderous animosity extent from the Jew towards us. This, by their actions and writings, is undeniable. There's also a very clear disrespect from this people towards all of the creation and creatures in it, not to mention an arrogance towards the Creator himself and his order. There is a preternatural instinct within these people to distort, pervert, and destroy. They have shown this natural tendency in every discipline that they are allowed to participate in. They will and have taken every single pure concept and derided it, debased it, defaced it, and remade it according to their own twisted desire. Tikkun olam, to heal the world. But that so-called healing only comes after they've destroyed. They are a blight on our institutions, but not for nothing. It's no accident that they are where they are and causing the mischief and the grief they appear to have been created to bring about. Every wrong perpetuated is an opportunity to right it. Every appearance of degeneracy and depravity in our highest institutions is a sign of our failure, and they will be used to refine us, make no mistake about it. And here we are now. We find ourselves in a world of gray, gray science, gray law, gray politics, gray religion, gray history, gray morals, and gray scriptures. And yes, they are gray. They're very gray. If not, we'd not have thousands of denominations, hundreds of traditions, dozens and dozens of worldviews under just the umbrella of Christianity. The scriptures are gray, but that doesn't mean they have to stay that way. The spirit of the living God resides in his people. His spirit knows his word. He can do anything he chooses at any time. He has chosen a people to put his name upon. He has chosen a people to bless and try and test. One that would be a blessing to his creation. Is that the Jew? Does the Jew bless anything? Most hearing this know the answer to that. Most who will hear this know who bear the marks of Israel. Israel was tasked with keeping, guarding, and preserving, and perpetuating Yahweh's laws, his character, his institutions, his prophecy, and his will. But in order to act, we must identify the problem. I hope I've demonstrated enough of it to at least direct the mind of the listener in the appropriate direction. What work I've done to rediscover the language given our fathers and kept intact all those long centuries by Yahweh, our Creator and Covenanter, the language I call Obri, represents my best efforts at understanding the truth of scriptures once handed down to my fathers. I offer all I have and understand about it as I go freely 
And if anyone find a better means of expression of the pure language form, I am a ready and apt recipient. I don't want to start a new religion. I don't want honor and adoration. I want us, the children of Jacob Israel, to once again discover the history of our people with our Aliyim Yahweh. I want us as a people, as his people, to take up our rightful place in his creation, the called and chosen bearers of truth, compassion, and love modeled after you show Jesus. I offer all I have and all I can for the consideration, criticism, and hopefully edification and advancement of not our cause, but our duty, our destiny, and our birthright. We must all rise to our calling, stand firm, and obey the word. And to do so, to the best of our abilities, we must know and understand the word, which demands that we understand what's been done to the word, so that it may be repaired and once again stand as the clear, uncontroversial covenants, instructions, history, and prophecies of our people, and the light of restitution, a renewed creation, and the authentic healing of the world. For the Obrey Project, I'm John MacTemus. Thank you.